The first thing I would say is the work I'm going to show you is actually to do with young audiences and humour, and it's research we've done around tapping into humour for young audiences. Um, but it's also about how we use research to affect strategy around content commissioning and thinking about content. This work was a pan-BBC piece, so that means it's as relevant for visual as it is for audio, but what I've done is pulled out all the audio examples about how you can sort of underpin this and what, how it translates into, into audio. So, without further ado, um, I think I don't have to tell anyone in this room how competitive the audio environment is. I think everyone is well aware of that. It's something that's been talked about a lot. I think in the UK, the um, behaviours of young audiences is slightly more heightened um, in terms of the, the market space for linear radio compared to, compared to Ireland, but it's all sort of telling us the same thing, which is young audiences are making use of all the formats out there when it comes to audio. They have a massive suite of stuff available to them and they are using it. And we are seeing the effects of that in their behavior in the UK. So what this slide does, and I'll try and get out of the road. What the slide is showing is the change in share of audio hours of young audiences in the UK between 2017 and 2019. And it's showing that linear radio is now accounting for about 42% of all their share of hours, which is still huge. Um, but it is down from 46% of their share of hours. Things like music streaming has moved up from 21% to 32% of their audio hours in a week. And actually, things like podcasts, although still relatively small, are growing rapidly in this space. So they were a 2% share of audio hours in 2017. They're now worth 6% of the audio hours in, in 2017, so, or 2019. So it does show you just how much the market's evolving, how quickly it's shifting. And we are a real advantage here because actually we are the masters of audio. And you know, no one is better placed to, to tap into all of these formats than people who've made the audio for a living every day of the week. Um, a few years ago I did some research for the youth networks around what, with all these formats available, what are the kind of key qualities of radio that we should really be tapping into and making, making more use out of. Now, particularly for the BBC youth networks, because they're much more music based, they said to us, look, there are two key pillars that you've got to hit every time. The first one is music discovery, because we all know music discovery is an essential part of radio. But the second one was our ability to capture the spirit of the age. Um, what that means is, it's kind of just been able to reflect the youth zeitgeist of the minute, what's happening at the moment. And at the moment, authenticity is the name of the game. So young audiences are really drawn towards stuff that they feel, or they perceive to be authentic. And the best way I can kind of describe this to you, or show you this in an illustration, is the kind of artists that they're drawn towards. What we've got is artists who are hugely credible as musicians, but they're also grounded down to earth. They're as comfortable on a big stage as they are on a small one. Um, you know, it's Ed Sheeran coming out on Glastonbury stage with guitar and it's all stripped back. It's that kind of thing. They don't try too hard to follow the rule book equally. They're not trying too hard to be rebels either. They just are. And I think one of the key things that they use very, very well is their sense of personality and humor to tap into their audience, to show their authenticity. Take the Lewis Capaldi moment at Glastonbury. You know, it's actually a really good way to connect with your audience very, very authentically. And we see lots of brands doing this as well. So some of the biggest sort of youth brands, like Spotify, have used their listening stats to connect with listeners and say, you know, hey, you that's listened to Lonely Hearts 100 times on Valentine's Day, it's okay. That kind of thing. It's showing how you can use humor as a way in. So we wanted to get underneath the skin of this a bit more and sort of understand how, what makes young audiences laugh and how we sort of can connect with them in a more um, relatable base. I'm not going to bore you too much with the methodology, but it is worth it's kind of pointing out how we went about this. Uh, most of the people who took part in the study were between the ages of 12 to 30. We had a control group then of 30 to 40 year olds to understand family viewing and things like that around humour. Um, we got everyone to tell us and show us examples of things that were making them laugh in the media, things they found humorous, content they found humorous over a 10 day period. We collected over 1,500 pieces of humorous content um, across TV, radio and online. And then we took all of those examples and we gave them to a semiotician. So semiotics is more of an academic field. It's the study of culture, language and design. A semiotician can kind of tell you why we think 
hot is red and blue is cold. They can tell you why we see, you know, the save icon on computers is a floppy disk, even though like Gen Z have never held a floppy disk in their lives. So they're sort of trying to understand the, the subconscious drivers almost of all of this stuff. And with all the academic thinking and the sort of sp the expert interviews and things like that, they took all of the examples and mapped them onto the academic work. And they came back to us and said, look, there's no one way to make a young person laugh. Shocking, I know. But they did give us this really good spectrum and this great framework to work with. Um, on the left-hand side, actually it's my left, yes, your left-hand side, is um, shared humour. And shared humour is essentially that kind of stuff that's all warm and accessible, we're all laughing with each other, it's quite light-hearted and we're all in it together. On the other side of the spectrum is pointed humour. So it's saying, you know, it's quite spiky, it's comes from laughing at people, it's a bit more pokey and provocative. Then at the bottom of the framework is visceral, instantaneously funny laughter. So a person falls over, just funny. That kind of thing, so you don't have to think about it, it's out, out of the bag. But on the top of the framework is intellectual humour, so it's a bit more witty, you probably have to think about it, you might have some context in the background of it, and so it takes a while for the penny to drop. This gives you four different content buckets to think about. Um, the bottom left, Mirthful Uplift, is just a very nice BBC way of saying silly, light-hearted banter. It's just nice, light content. The top left is Cultural Capital. Um, cultural Capital is still warm and accessible, but you probably need the context in order to get the joke. A lot of pop culture references live in this box. A lot of the internet, actually, and meme culture lives in this box. Um, on the right, provocation is stuff that's spikier, but also is intelligent, like, uh, I would say, like Ricky Gervais and Frankie Boyle, probably, that style of comedy sits in, in here. And then bottom left is Danger and Edge, so still accessible, um, still sort of instantaneously funny, sorry, but a bit more riskier. And I think things like Dairy Girls, even Mrs. Brown Boys at points, kind of floats into this, this spectrum. When we mapped all of the 1,500 pieces, it showed us that for young audiences particularly, they lean towards the left-hand side of the spectrum, particularly that kind of bottom left, but also top left corner. Um, I'm saying here that when we got to the focus groups, it wasn't that they didn't value stuff that sits in the space, they do. In terms of quantity though, it's a bit like how people value Blue Planet, but they don't necessarily want to watch Blue Planet and David Attenborough every day of the week. You don't need a lot of it. Um, every single piece of content was given a type of funny, at least one type of funny. The semiotician went completely mad and gave us 60 types of funny. I bet you didn't know there were 60 different types of sense of humour, but there is. Um, but it really helped us to understand the, the different types of, of uh, formats and content that you can actually have. So for example, bottom left, things like silliness and cheesiness, funny mannerisms, randomness, absurdness, all of that sits bottom left. Things like intertextuality, this explains meme culture. Um, it's where you can take something, change it, make it slightly your own, send it out into the universe, somebody else takes it, they change it and take a spin on it. It's sort of mashed up thinking. Um, that is why it works so well in that space. So this gave us a lot to work with and what we did was start to plot our own content onto this. Um, I think in practice what this helped us to do was sort of reflect on what we were giving the audience and also the opportunities for growth and the areas that we thought we could expand into and sort of um, bolster or offer. For Radio 1 particularly, a lot of the daytime content sits in the bottom left. Um, things like the hide and seek, unpopular opinions is a, is a popular feature that uh, is very light, light hearted and you end a bingo, I think probably a lot of people sort of know of or heard of. Then on the top left, it tends to be when we had guests and, and celebrities in that we started to tap into the, the cultural capital moments. Uh, we do have some presenters that sort of fall into this kind of more risky area, like Smoochie Shy or Dotty. Um, but it also made us really think about the role of podcasts. Because podcasts as a medium, a lot of our research backs up that they uh, are much more suited to a sort of more raw format. It's informal in style, and people expect a kind of rawness and intimacy with, form, with, with podcasts. And that allows us to start to play with humour in a different way that maybe we just can't do as, as much on, on linear radio, particularly during the daytime. 
So this helped us think about our podcast strategy. And we have things like Asian Network have Brown Girls Do It Too, very risky sex podcast. Uh, we have Unexpected Fluids, which is another sex podcast for Radio 1. Um, Gemma Collins, which really tapped into like a pop culture thing. Dr uh, RuPaul's Drag Race, another sort of pop culture one. So again, it just makes you think about what you want to say about your brand personality in different spaces and how you use those formats, formats to the best of their um, ability. Right, now I'm just going to get show you sort of three hints and tips that came from this work. The first one is, and we've talked about this, the thing about authenticity, and it's a word that gets thrown around a lot. People say, you know, like, of course it has to be relevant and of course it has to be authentic, but what does that mean when it comes to making content? Actually, a lot of it means just creating real moments where you're, you're sort of creating real reactions, and there's nothing better than radio to capture a real reaction. Um, recognizable scenarios, you know, so features where people can kind of reflect on themselves and say, that's so me, I do that too, you know, it's, it's that sort of thing. And yesterday there was a whole conversation about uh, diversity. And this is why diversity is so important on the radio as well. People, especially young people, want to hear and see themselves in the content that we're making. And their world is diverse, so they need that coming back to them, and that is affecting your... Uh, perception of authenticity. At the end of the day, if we're not reflecting our world right, then we're not authentic. But I've pulled out a creative that I think really captures a couple of things really well when it comes to authenticity. Radio One had um, a stunt that they've called the escape room, where they kidnapped Greg James, the breakfast presenter, and they put him inside an escape room. He didn't know what was going to happen. And then he had to break out of it with the help of his audience. Now, that does two things. First, mirthful uplift. It's random. People didn't see it coming. The audience certainly didn't expect it. Greg didn't expect it. And it's authentic because none, none of it is really controlled. You know, he didn't know it was, it was happening. Um, I mean, these, this is a snapshot of the social listening that went on. People really got into it. They were out with their pens and pencils and trying to crack all the, the clues. Um, also, this is our online tracker, so it just sort of shows the online listening across the day, and it, that's really one the, across the two days that Greg was trapped in the room compared to the previous, same day the previous week. So it shows you that there is an uplift, it has an effect. This is the effect of live radio, this is what it's really good at. I'm going to play a clip so you can get an, like, an idea of this. Um, I'm not going to play the whole thing because it's a bit long, but Please let this be it. there's an idea of it. <laughs> Radio One's escape room. There's a man walking into the studio in a, in a cap. Gregory, you're being taken away. I'm being led out the building. I imagine I'm about to be kidnapped. It's been really great knowing you all. Oh my God, this is amazing and mad. What? Fail. Oh my God, what's <laughs> happening in here? That's amazing. It's a picture of notes on a piano. Postman Pat and his black and white cat. Oh my god, it's it gotta work. be! When I press unlock, this is my last guess. Okay, here we go. Yeah, we thought that. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't think. Yeah, imagine all this is based on the episode of Postman Pat where he's <laughs> delivered a spacesuit. Now, earlier on, uh, Chris Stark was at your house. Uh, Chris Stark was in your marital bed. Uh, so we thought we'd we'd get your lovely wife, Bella, on the line. <gasps> have you got any clues or anything? Me? Yes. Why would I have any clues? I'm not even watching it. That's how I'm feeling. You tried your date of birth, obviously. Try, try the date of birth. Have you tried one, two, three, four, five, six, Greg? Yeah, so I've tried one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> Thank you. And I've tried six, five, four, three, two, one. This is not helping. <laughs> okay, 28 hours in. Mad. Mad scribblings everywhere. All over here. I have a lead. I think I have a lead. All clues point towards Claudia, who is a star listener who's getting an AZ Harriet cookbook. So right now we can cross... Okay, I'm probably going to stop that there because it goes on, but he gets out. 
So, you know, just, just in case you're worried about him, he's not. Um, the other things that we've done sort of along this line, I mean, actually yesterday we, d we did another sort of stunt like this off, off the back of the Brit Awards, got loads of um, artists involved in it. And it's just amazing how the audience with social media and the radio just really come along with you now. It, and this is about like, yes, radio can be responsive, but radio can also just push things out into the world and make it real time, which is brilliant too. Um, Treasure Hunt's another one. We, we hid um, big weekend tickets around the UK and got listeners to try and find them. It was, and again, you can just see the, the uplift in, in the numbers. Um, the second insight when it comes to humour is that the audience seemed to be shifting to a more gentler tone of humour. Now, this doesn't mean you can't be mean, or it doesn't mean like you can't have banter and roast people. You absolutely can, but you just have to make sure you're punching up because what they don't really want is it to be really cruel and humiliating. The person needs to feel like they're almost laughing with you and that they're part of the joke rather than them being the, the brunt of the, of the joke. Um, the other thing is we've really noticed how humour plays a role in sort of uh, a light and shade, allowing access to much harder topics like science and fact, fact uh, factual and documentary. So particularly in podcasts, you know, you've got things like the Russell Brand podcast and stuff like that, which is trying to combine hard topics with, with humour and it's a, it's a way in for audiences. Um, so here what I'm saying is a playful approach is appreciated. It's sort of, in a way, a move away from a Big Brother style of content towards a First Dates style of content. And you can see the shift that Channel 4 has made in that. Um, this is, I think, well exemplified by one of our most popular features, which is actually called Unpopular Opinions. And the reason I picked this one is because it still has an element of kind of roasting going on because the audience have to tell us their most unpopular opinion that's not shared by the rest of the public. Um, but it's still done in a really playful Let's way. Do Brandon. I think Sean Paul is massively overrated. No, absolutely. No, just, he's just a, hang he's, up on he's him. He's a genius. Sean Paul makes every song better he's in. Yeah, of course. I, I, he's absolutely, there's no, he's a genius. There's not a song he's on at a remix that he's on that isn't good. I totally disagree. Yeah, yeah, that was so quick. How did you do that so quickly? Forget about it. It's Radio 1. We got Sean Paul coming out of our ears. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are. Jordi and we got this one. I didn't know if I was imagining that in my head. Yeah, of course. Oh, he's a genius. There's not a moment he comes on the radio where you're not like, come on. He makes driving fun. I don't care what you're doing. You can be stuck in traffic and he comes on and he want to dance. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Totally disagree. I'm, I'm sure sorry he's cool. about that. That is an unpopular opinion. Now yeah. I understand the game. <laughs> So, um, yeah, and another person I think is sort of a master of this is Scott Mills. He's very good at um, taking a really playful approach towards, towards his content. Um, he had Anne-Marie in the studio, and he got Chris Stark to pretend to be a listener called Steve, a super fan called Steve on the line. And Anne-Marie was to play a game with him over the phone about who knew her best. And it just got really awkward because Steve was just really awkward phone calls a listener. But Anne Marie didn't know this. It was, a, it was a prank that we were playing on her. And it got to the point where she was on the floor, like rolling around on the floor, trying to keep in her laughter. So this video, actually, I'm not going to play it. So go and check it out because it's too long. Um, but it's got over like 600,000 views. It did really, really well. And really, it's again, you know, it's kind of mean to play a prank on Anne Marie, but it was all in good fun. And, you know, it wasn't like she was the butt of the joke. So there is ways of doing this. That leans us into a more uh, light-hearted space. The last one I think I'm going to share with you is express, express modern transgression. So not every piece of humour has to be transgressive. It doesn't have to break social taboos. But when you do it, there is a difference in what it means now for younger audiences. Older audiences are still tend to laugh at things like sex or drugs, right? Because it's a topic that's not talked about a lot. So even in its very nature, by bringing it up, people are a bit like, tee -hee, you know? But actually for younger audiences, because it's not sa none of this stuff is sacred because it's out there so young, that actually the, the laughter comes from the shared uncomfortable truth. That is where the laughter is coming from, this kind of, like Brexit, it doesn't matter if you voted in or right, everybody's witnessing what's going on. And that's the uncomfortable truth in the audience. Um, transgression can be done in loads of different ways, but these are some of the three kind of top threes that gain traction with younger people. Dark humour, so I don't know if you know what a dank meme is, Google it. Uh, it's really, it's really just strange pictures that make no sense, but it's like lack of moral absence. Um, 
there is things like Black Mirror are very good at dark humour, where you're playing around with like how dark can the human mind really go? Where can society go? It's so dark it's almost funny. That's the kind of thing that they find funny underneath it all. So it's stuff that maybe doesn't necessarily out, set out to be funny, but it ends up being kind of in a weird way funny. Awkward humour, cringe moments, mockumentaries, all of that as well. And then brave ideological humour. I think things like the MASH Report and Beyond Today uh, podcast sum up this quite well um, because it's sort of coming from a bit more of an inclusive place. But we have really done a lot with this last one in terms of our podcast and the role the podcast play. And you can see how it's sort of influencing the commissioning slate for podcasts. So that is it. What I'm going to sum up to say is, I would say think about how you can use the humour framework, how you could sort of use that to think about your offer if you're an ENCE at all. Uh, you could start to map your presenters across this and just look at your gaps and your opportunities. The second one, think about the power of radio, the live medium, and how you can create real, relatable reactions and scenarios. Like, it is a medium that's full of play and the audience want to get on board. Um, this sort of more playful shift and less cruel approach, just take it on board, always punch up. You can roast, you can. Just remember who, who's the you know, butt of the joke and remember who that person is. Um, execute editorial care, I would say there. And the last one, podcast, think about the role they can play within your, within your offer and what they're doing for your brand. That's it. <laughs> you time for questions? We do have time for questions if you have any. Or do you have any? Yes. Uh, when, you, when you came up with the, the quadrants... Yes, well, I didn't, but the, yes. The quadrants, <laughs> how did the networks respond to that or the, the producers thinking about what do they do? you know do? what? I actually find, um, because production are so creative and they are more lateral thinkers than literal thinkers, frameworks like this really work because it's stimulus to like knock your ideas up against. And when they started to talk about in their teams, they started to go, oh yeah, actually, you know, Nick's style of comedy is more like this and Scott's style of comedy is more like that. And it helps them to think about the uniqueness of their show that they work on and that's sort of what it's bringing to the table. So I would say this worked really well for, for things like that and I think there's loads of mileage in this kind of research because it can be applied to so many scenarios. You could take all of your Viz content and, and you know, put it out. You could look at just podcasts, you could look at your music, you know, like it's, there's loads of ways to just think about this and use it effectively. Yeah. I would love to say like they pushed back but they didn't. Not this time. <laughs> Any others? No. I think we're done. Or not? We have one. Hi, how are you doing? Um, this is more kind of observation or um, discussion point, I suppose. Uh, I work in a, a media agency, uh, huh? and I have to say, I'm very energised by uh, your, your examples there. I think the whole notion of maybe radio stations coming in and, and telling agencies about those kind of live events, the escape room type stuff, really gets you to think about radio yeah, differently, in a whole way. more than just music. Yeah. You know, it's really energised content. Yeah, one of the, so that work that I talked about at the very beginning that I did a few years ago, when we were talking about the qualities of radio, I think we all know radio is live, but we say it so flippantly. But when you think about it, you know, radio is live. That means there's no double takes, there's no second guessing, and the audience really know that and they value that. And there is a point at which you can get so professional with radio, sometimes it doesn't feel live. So you've got to make sure that you're kind of making that balance of they do want structure and they obviously want, you know, to know that's when I eat my breakfast and that's when I get out the door and those are all my cues. But equally, that sort of organic improv aspect of radio, but I just think this shows the power of radio's effect in the atmosphere as well, how if you start something, it can really take off. Um, so yes, it's, it's been really fun, actually, to, to watch the teams kind of come up with different scenarios. And I would say, as time has gone on, we have improved our thinking. So for the Brit Awards one, they started to think about how they incorporate BBC Sounds into all of this. And what they've done is included um, the clues inside Greg James's podcast. So people had to go to BBC Science and think about the podcast and download it and, like, and then crack the clue from the... So it's sort of about using all of these um, stunts to kind of to tie up our ecosystems as well. Yeah. Are we good? We're good. <laughs> Thanks very much.